What is a strike? When a bunch of ungrateful, lazy cockroaches can't get their act together and decide to block honest work for other people. What do the strikers want? Beats me. They mumble nonsense about board rules and workers' rights, while we have the right to work! When the man moves around, you perceive some serious abs underneath his tight-fitting shirt. This man is in shape. There's something odd in the way he carries himself. His set of clothing looks vaguely mismatched. The different pieces of the attire seem ill-fitting. Ill-fitting? What does that mean? His shirt is far too small and an unpleasantly tight fit, while the overalls held up by a belt seem to fit a man with much more corpulence. You wearing your clothes? He ignores your question, choosing instead to turn to the emaciated workers, raising both fists in the air. The clothes are obviously not his. Silence is the answer. There's something off here, but he won't say what. As he does, he stops his foot on the pavement and... Stop everything. Look at that sweet pair of boots on his feet. They would absolutely compliment your soul. Would let your style fly even higher. Sweet boots. That require details. Boots. Black in color, crafted of hardened leather, if you had to guess. They look sturdy and stable, useful in rugged environments. Imagine what you could do with boots like this. Not be a little fucking weakling baby, for starters. There are boots for mewling, and there are boots for smashing shit. Damn. You're right. Super sweet. Where can I get in this badass brute fashion? Ask the man. Ask around. The doors of good taste are open to you. Be in vogue. Dude, those are some sweet boots. Can I have them? No. Come on. Why not? Establishment hasn't had its fill. Is that right? First they obstruct our work. Then they come for our shoes. I'm hardly the establishment. That's what they always say before stabbing you in the back. You want boots? Go find your own. Who are all these strike breakers? Honest men and women with rights to work, to be useful, not toys for corporate interests. We came here to help the harbor run smoothly in time of crisis. If union fucks don't want work, they ought to let in those who do want work. I have a question. Why do all these men follow your leadership? Now that is interesting. You think they follow because I'm big and loud? No. They follow the rules of the market, the rules of the economy, because they were... Given a job to do! You've been talking to him for quite a while now. Something is off with this guy. Ask him where he's from. What exactly is your goal here? We were promised work. We'd be in there, working, if the bastards hadn't shut the gates. And you're unable to breach the entrance? Main gate's locked. It would take heavy ordnance to bust it open. Could try to get in through the secretary's office. Door's locked. The guards blocking the way to the access panel. And I don't mean the scrawny mess punk either. I mean head measurer. Or whatever he is. Have you considered storming in? Like all of you? Why don't you go arrest them instead? I'm sure they've done plenty of criminal shit. They have that look. It would be better for the neighborhood if you went home. At least for now, if you can't get in anyway. No! They will give up eventually. Or get drunk. Leave the button unguarded. Then, we charge. He seems to be following his orders well enough for now. But beneath it all, 
There is a boiling rage and a dangerous carelessness. Do not be fooled by the programming. There is a precarious balance inside him, keeping him in check. But it's shaky as hell, and he's tired of it all. Are you a mercenary hired by Wild Pines? Free flow of commerce! Don't talk to him any longer. Just leave, please. Is there a tribunal being convened by any chance? Fucking fuck. A punch is not imminent, but it's being cocked hard. You hear a tiny rattle, a small radio cracking somewhere. An earpiece. I'm going to interpret that as a yes. There's a tribunal, and it won't be long until it's ready. How about you? Fuck off now, huh? Okay, of course. There could be weapons aiming at us right now. Somewhere above, in the buildings. The other Merc. Don't push this. He's thinking, this is not the time. Okay. The man's breathing steadies, but his eyes are still narrow. Slowly, he's trying to get his right to work dance back on. It's hard to do that when you want to beat a man into a pulp instead. I'm just going to leave now. This is the night watchman's booth. The name on the door reads Rene Arnaud. A colorful uniform lies neatly folded on the table. I don't know about stealing people's very colorful clothes like that. This is gonna take my shit to the next level. Fantastic. Try not to wear it with other similarly colorful clothes, okay? Leo, Leo. In the future, can we keep this greeting shorter? Sure, mister. Absolutely. I'm always willing to help out nice fellows such as yourself. Are you the Leo who wrote the notes to make more banners? Oh, yes, yes. I leave all kinds of notes for myself. That old head of mine ain't so good at keeping things in no more. I almost forgot about the borscht. What was that about the borscht? Oh, yes. I've been taking special whirling borscht to the men every day since the strike started. <laughs> it's very, very good. Makes a man feel so warm and happy. I feel like I could take on Mr. Renadan's boar dogs every time the lunch is done. Power borscht, huh? Never heard of a borscht that turns little guys into dog fighters. Alcohol, however. What do you mean by taking this soup to the men? Is it for striking? Yes, yes. I'm taking it to them. The borscht keeps them happy and in fighting spirits. Makes you all warm inside. They brew it in the whirling in rags. Hold up. Who makes it at the whirling? Oh, the whirling's cook. He makes it. Them is always talking with Mr. Manana in that weird language and laughing together. He doesn't speak what we speak. He's from Grad. Looks like the borscht is spiked. I'm gonna look into it. Oh, sure, mister. Sure. You do that. Yes, sir. He didn't actually understand what you meant. And now he's just nodding along. Okay, I'm off. Mr. Dubois, the word in Martinez is a certain police officer is once again happily reunited with his service weapon. Congratulations, my friend. I prefer my police officers old-fashioned like that. With a gun. You can do so many things with a gun that you can't do without one. Now, what can I help you with? Look, my gun. My, my. She's quite the looker, Harry. You can't imagine how pleased I am the two of you are reunited. Tell me, was it difficult to convince the pigs to give it up? Not at all. I knew you could handle it. I know my special policeman. Anyway, I'm glad you're all right and armed again, Harry. Now, 
What can Everard Claire do for you? What's in the container that's outside your office? My dear Harry, there are literally millions of containers in this harbour. I couldn't possibly remember what's in all of them. There's something special about it. It was attached to the Clausen crane. Harry, you smooth-talking son of a bitch. Time is a precious resource, and I don't have enough of it to count containers with you. Smooth-talking? Maybe that's the way to go about opening the container. You should at least try convincing it. I met a girl named Cell who said she's working with you. Funny. Hmm. That doesn't ring any bells, Harry. Funny. She was trying to set up a narcotics operation in the old church on the coast. Oh, that's a cell. Yes, I do seem to remember sending a pretty young thing down there to liven up the place. Get some anodic music in there. Did you also tell her to start the amphetamine lab? Amphetamine lab? That sounds very immoral and debauched. Frankly, a health risk. But what do I know about kids these days? The music they listen to, the drugs they do while they listen to that music. It sounds to me like you are trying to start an amphetamine lab in the district. And you're using some delinquents you found God knows where to set it up and run it for you. Found God knows where? That Acel is the daughter of Miko the Kebab, a man who once killed a guy with a kebab. I think a daughter of a man who killed a man with a kebab can handle running a little nightclub, don't you? Mick with a kebab? Really? Maybe it was Bogovic. Or Jakob. I think it might have been Conrad. Anyway, I shut down the amphetamine production, but let them go on with the nightclub plan. A nightclub? Harry, I'm an old-fashioned guy. After work, I like to listen to some rock and roll music and have a non-alcoholic lager. Nightclubs don't interest me. But here I am, talking about myself, when you have much more important things going on. Tell me, Harry, how can I help you? I'm looking into your shady brew. I don't know what that means, Harry. Shady brew? There are so many moving parts in my operation, I can't keep track of them all. You know what? Don't even tell me. Whatever it is, do it. Surprise me. Just one thing. If you can, make it even shadier. He sincerely has no idea what you were talking about. And he doesn't care either. A few more questions about the harbor. I'm always happy to educate and entertain you, my friend. So, what's on your mind? Can I ask you about specific union members? We're way past specific union members now. This is the big time. We're talking about the future of Revachol here, Harry. You can bother Leonard with that. He loves to run his mouth on such matters. But I'm in big time mode, Harry. There's something different about him now. He's more vibrant, more alive in his big time mode. That's it for now. Very nice, Harry. Is there anything else? Everett, I'm going to leave now, but we might talk again later. Leo, you seem to know everyone around here. I want to ask about someone. Mr. Everett doesn't really want me to talk to people about Union guys. But who did you want to talk about? Tell me about this Edgar guy you keep mentioning. Mr. Edgar is Mr. Everett's brother. He looks a bit younger, he does, but a very smart fellow. Very smart fellow indeed. He's away on some union business. Not even in Revershaw, they say. All kinds of places he visits. Him and his brother both do when they're on a vacation. Right now, it's Mr. Everett's turn to look after the union. But last year, he spent a whole winter in South Africa. <laughs> Left with the first autumn rains and didn't come back before the trees were green again. <laughs> South Safari. A lot of bulk chemical manufacturing going on there. A lot of cargo shipments being made, too. The trade must have been lucrative for the trip to be so long. Tell me about Manana. He's a union man through and through. Good guy. He's very calm, laid back, doesn't do much, talks to Everard sometimes. Honestly, I don't know what he does for us, 
but it must be important because everybody likes him. Yes, they do. I think that's what he does. He makes everyone feel a little better. Oil for the wheels. Much needed in stressful times like these. Tell me about Measure Head. Oh, he's really something. <laughs> he doesn't talk much to me usually, but when he does, I don't really understand most of what he's saying. Actually, I don't think he would like me running my mouth about him like that. Once he said he's a dragon to this mob fellow who came picking a fight with some Union men. Yeah, I think he really believes Jean Luc was a dragon because he ran right off. Another time he almost killed another guy, but I shouldn't talk about that. That's precisely what he is, Everard's dragon. Tell me about Titus. Oh, Titus is a longshoreman through and through. He was born on a boat, they say. His veins are probably filled with salt water, I tell you. <laughs> nice, friendly sort, old Titus is. He's probably one of those rare specimens who are born when two drunk seamen stumble on top of each other on the deck amidst a storm so violent it flings whales around. Tell me about Everett. Uh, I guess not. I mean, I could, but I don't think Mr. Everett would like it very much. You better ask him yourself, mister. Actually, I want to talk something else. Uh, sure, mister. What can Leo do for you? Okay, I'm off. You're back before the cargo container. Its draw has not lessened since you were last here. If anything, it seems to have grown slightly. Despite the dirt that surrounds and trails you, a beacon of light emerges from deep within you. Hello? Is, is there anybody in there? The door stands silent. Satisfied, detective? Try again. If there's someone in there, I'd like to talk to you. Just like that, you hear a click, then a rattle. Some mechanism unlocks itself inside the door. Ahoy! Come on in! You can't be serious. The man stands at the far end of the shipping container. It's hard to say anything more about him. You cannot make out any of his details, but you do feel the overwhelming presence of capital. The feeling causes all the hairs on your body to stand at attention, like soldiers preparing for review. Something's amiss. The light beams bend around his face and scatter in a thousand directions. It seems the laws of physics do not apply here. They are suspended, distorted, and echo. In the general stillness, only your tongue moves, flickering as you utter wow welcome come in make yourself at home sorry i'm not better able to receive you i wasn't expecting visitors today you can't hear him exactly yet you're able to understand every word he says it is very strange an overwhelming hum covers everything voice doesn't escape from him now what can I do for you, gentlemen? Who are you? Who am I? <laughs> oh, I haven't been asked that question for such a long time. I don't meet a lot of people outside my circle these days. Anyhow, my name is Rustam Diodore, investor, license holder, and extremely high net worth individual. And you are? Mr. Diodor, I am Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi of the RCM, and this is my partner. Harrier Dubois. Pleasure to meet you, Harrier Dubois. I must admit, the name suits you very well. How did you become so rich? Oh lord, not this again. What's the matter, Kim? Oh, nothing. It's just that we've got this murder to solve, and yet you go around asking everyone about money, 
And every time I ask, are you sure this is related to the case, you say, sure, Kim, I think it is. And yet, it never seems to get us any closer to solving the case. <laughs> it's quite all right. I'm used to the question by now. To be blunt, I inherited my fortune from my grandmother, who herself was an extremely high net worth individual back in Graz. All I did was take her fortune and invest it prudently. Believe it or not, it takes more than a bit of skill not to blow a vast fortune on sailing boats, bad choices and unsupervised state policy. And blow. Actually, at the level this guy is, it takes several generations to do that. But all right. What's it like being an extremely high net worth individual? I gotta tell you, at first, being rich is a lot of work. You've got to work hard because everything's so darn expensive. You know, prices increase exponentially at this income level. But then, once you've reached my position, it's nearly impossible for me not to make money. My assets are so diversified that I'm bound to come out ahead no matter what. Some of my lower net worth friends say to me, but doesn't that take all the fun out of it? And I tell them, not really. Don't you think that you should use your great wealth for the glory of your fatherland? Which one? Revachol, where I nominally reside, or Graz, where my father immigrated from, or Ildekashebro, where I've registered my shell companies. For almighty Revachol, of course. Listen, Mr. Dubois. If capital and nationalism went hand in hand, there'd be no need to ask the question. States are akin to boulders in a river, slowing the free flow of ideas. Given enough time, the water will wear those boulders down. Man, being a high net worth individual sounds great. It is truly. It's almost entirely carefree. It really leaves you time to better yourself spiritually. Hey, hey, all this talk about money has made you use the thread. What is going on with the light in this place? That's what you need to ask him about. There's something strange about you. What do you mean? Well, I don't know how to put it. You look somehow a little different. Are you talking about my chin? No, no, I mean, I can't even see you. It's as if something is happening to the light. Oh, that's what you mean. Yes, I've heard of this effect, though I've never witnessed it myself, of course. It has something to do with our vice Wiesemann coefficient. The vice Wiesemann coefficient is a ratio designed to reflect the difference in net worth between individuals. When the coefficient is close to 1, or 100%, it means one person possesses all the net worth among that group of individuals. It's been observed that when the weiss Weisman coefficient reaches about 0.96 or so, the laws of physics begin to bend around the high net worth individual. So what is our coefficient? The weiss Weisman coefficient for you and this individual appears to be 0.9998 repeating. That's not good for you. Are you telling me that you're so rich that light literally bends around your face? Among other things. But calm down. I'm but a lowly single digit billionaire. Really? No, not really. <laughs> there are actually quite many digits. A man this chill is at least a triple digit billionaire. Kim, are you seeing this weird stuff? I see nothing of the sort. To be frank, all I see is a gentleman who is unusually well dressed for Martinez in a cargo container, which I admit is odd. Yes, I imagine that does look strange to you. My container. What are you doing in this container? Traveling. This is a great way to get around. It's fun, it's safe, 
and it gives me lots of time to think. I wouldn't say it's exactly safe now, but financially secure individuals are known adrenaline junkies. By the way, let me now ask you a question. Where are we exactly? In the very, very early days of colonizing this archipelago, the Kingdom of Serenes, a precursor of a modern Sir Leclerc, used to own the city of Rivershaw, an obscure detail in the bigger picture, but still worth dropping. We're in Rivershaw, formerly a colony of the Kingdom of Serenes name. Ah, a fellow history buff. I myself am currently reading up on Franco-Nigerian era trains. Very interesting stuff. It's a shame I can't get out and explore myself. One of the downsides of being an extremely high net worth individual is that mobs of low net worth individuals are constantly banding together to ask for money. Wait, why don't you help them? We got so much money it can't make a difference. There simply aren't enough hours a day to hand out all the handouts. It's like feeding seagulls. There are always more and they never seem to do anything interesting with it. Except more seagulls. Spending money is a matter of desire. I'm sure you agree. I don't have the desire for spending it like that. So you travel from place to place via shipping container? Smart, no? It also provides a means to hide from all the targeted advertising we extremely high net worth individuals are constantly subjected to. Luxury yachts, high fidelity portable radio systems, fail proof outdoor and so on. It just gets a bit middle class after a while. A bit bourgeois. Those things are sound pretty nice. Don't get me wrong, they are nice things, but once you achieve a certain level of wealth, your time and mental space become much more important than material goods. He speaks from the heart. He has very different problems compared to low net worth individuals such as yourself. For example, no problems at all. Ah, so you're saying being rich isn't worth the hassle? What? No, I didn't say that at all. Being rich is great. Uh, just don't tell anyone I told you that. You're a rich investor, right? Can I have some money? Could you please stop asking people for money? It does not reflect well on the RCM, and to be perfectly frank, we can't afford to look worse than we already do. But Kim, I also can't afford to look any better than I do now. That's why I need the money. It's perfectly alright. Based on your appearance, I can tell I'm dealing with a smart man. As you may know, us high net worth individuals do not have a lot of cash on hand. Investments and liquidity are enemies of one another. I think I only have coins for coffee machines. Here is 3 real. How much can you get for this? Unbelievable. You manage to meet a man who's so rich, light literally bends around him, and all you can get out of him is three real? What's wrong with you? Are you sure don't have any more? Don't you want a billionaire? Yes, I'm sure. You know, maybe you can make that money grow. Come up with an investment plan. How's that sound? This is a proposal, not a question. These ultra-liberal types love losing huge sums of money on ludicrous proposals. Ergo, you should come up with a plan that's totally dead in the water. What's worse than throwing money at something that's already failed? Okay, so I've got this idea for a board game. Go on. Brace yourself. It's very high concept. I'm ready. It's a pen and paper game where people all over the world can play with each other using radios. Nick and an idea 
that wasn't worth anything in the first place, and trying to pass it off as your own? How very entrepreneurial. I love it. Hold on. Have we met before? Maybe. I wouldn't really know. No. On second thought, it couldn't have been you. Your idea reminds me of a group of young men who came to me a long time ago, calling themselves Fortress Accident. The name should have been a red flag. They pitched me and a handful of other investors on an idea for a role-playing game that would, in their words, change the world. <laughs> what happened? Well, at first everything was rosy. The ideas were solid, but they were lacking in... How do I put it? They lacked the will to get things done. As their financial situation became more desperate, their ideas devolved from realistic to absolute insanity. We lost all of our money. High art types never deliver. They're only good for peddling Wilkins or whatever creeps they come up with. I guess the inordinate amount of time they put into drawing mythical creatures did not generate a return on investment. Wait, where are they now? Nobody knows for sure, but the place can't be pretty. Did you try to salvage the project somehow? Sadly, when we got there, it was too late. The concept had run out of steam. Only dust remained. What I want to tell you is this. It's a very bad idea. Dead in the water. You seem like a reasonable man, but that is not a reasonable plan. Okay. Well, maybe I was wrong. We've all learned something today. Are you sure you don't want to give those little Wilkins a second go? Absolutely not. Stop embarrassing yourself. Pop a magnesium and calm down. Deploying high concept buzzword generator. All systems functional. Ready to engage in three, two, one. It's time to disrupt the future. You've got to stay lean, innovative, and focus on what matters most, the children. Steal the union boss's idea, add a twist, and present it as your own. Very capitalistic. You should invest in a youth center. A youth center, huh? What kind of youth center? A place to train, buff kids. A place to teach them practical skills like teamwork and self-discipline. Come on, tell him what he wants to hear. One dedicated to instilling liberal economic values in children from low net worth families. Brilliant! Without children, who'll be there to buy stuff in the future? Yes, if it doesn't work out, we can always repurpose the center as a shopping mall or private equity firm. When life closes a door, it opens a window, yes? What's the expected return on this? Highly educated, work-ready human capital ready to be directed towards any number of your vast interests. You're deep into ultra-liberal territory now. Good work. Very impressive. You've got a natural eye for unusual investment opportunities. I know. I don't normally do this without a formal pitch deck, but to hell with it. What's the point of being rich if you have to follow all the rules? Here's the round of seed funding. This should be enough to prove out the concept and get things off the ground. Cha-ching! What'll it be? Speed? Vodka? Cigarettes? Bratan! Now's your chance to take some time off! Spend it with your good buddy, and get absolutely wrecked in the process! I'm sorry man, I'm an investor now. I have to stay sober to calculate risks. What is this shit? Calculating risks? Bratan! The risks you can't calculate are the only ones worth taking! I'm sorry, I just see the ROI in that. The lieutenant looks at you with horror. You've been mumbling to your necktie in a daze for several minutes. 
Ah, yes. Now you're displaying it. The eccentricity that becomes a wealthy individual. Thank you for placing your unwavering trust in me. Remember, it's not a handout. It's an investment, and I expect to see returns. The lieutenant stands there, dumbfounded. His mouth opens slightly, then closes again. Is he having a stroke? What do you think, Kim? Not bad, huh? I'm not unimpressed. Let's leave it at that. Now, was there anything else I could help you gentlemen with? We should get back to our investigation. Take a few time. The pleasure was mine. Unfortunately, I must be away soon. The next time we meet, I'll be expecting an update on my investment. Farewell, friend. And may your peace of mind guide you to happiness. The man ponders his cooking utensils and gives you a little nod, acknowledging your presence. What isn't that borscht you're making there? The man says a couple of sentences in that strange language of his and then seems to wait for you to speak. I'm pretty sure he asked you a question. He doesn't know your language. You can just say something cool in return. Mercury rising. Hmm. Horse need more vodka? Okay, so it's vodka that keeps the men happy and in good spirits. Clever move by the Union. Vodka Borscht! I love it, Bratan! Turn it the fuck up and then ask for some yourself! Turning it up seems like a dangerous idea, honestly. The place is a powder keg. Yes, turn the vodka up. He smiles, nodding vigorously, then pours half a bottle of vodka into the pot. With a whistle, he stirs the brew. Gotta see, could I have some of that brew? He smiles and nods enthusiastically and, chattering away in his language, ladles some brew into a small thermal cup, then hands it to you. You said your friends with manana, is that true? The mention of manana gets his attention. He smiles and delivers a whole slew of unfamiliar words and lively gestures. Then he falls silent again. They're friends. Do you know what's behind that door? He looks up at you, then looks away quickly, shrugging and muttering something to himself. Shrugging is an international sign for, no, I don't know what's behind that door. I don't think I need anything else. Stay masculine! Well, hello. Someone seems to have found himself a bottle of alcohol. Here's where the magic happens. Light reflects off the thermal cup. The borscht may not look like much, but doubtless it'll get the job done. Better pop it open before it gets cold. Wow, the gods of mass production have made this alcohol container laughably easy to open. A child could have done it. I don't know about this. There's a satisfying pop as the cap comes off, and the hair on your back rises like an army at attention. You've been here before. Welcome back, detective. You're home now. You see a flash of teeth, a young woman smiling at you, near some railway overpass in your ruined past. She is gorgeous. And she is yours. What will be the repercussions if I take that sip? Nothing. Some mental stuff. Nothing to be worried about. Physically, you'll be strong as an ox. A golden sun melts down your throat. Its oh. rays filling your nostrils with sunshine. Your stomach melts from it into a happy, gooey mess. So does your mind. 
All the bad things are melting. You're you again. A real cop. A real detective. Incredibly well done. From the void we came and to the void we must return. <laughs>